Hey, Jan Tukawi here, and we're going to be talking about languages, natural, made up, and what it means for our brains and our minds. Uh, Jan Tukawi is my Tokipona name. Tokipona is a language that I had not heard about until three weeks ago. It's a conlang, a constructed language, meaning that it was created by, in this case, basically one human being and then a community formed around her. And it only has like 125 words in it, the entire language. And some people have added more, maybe go up to 140, 160, 170. But as someone who's learning Spanish right now, and with thousands and thousands of verbs that I have to memorize the conjugations of, and there's like 50 forms of each verb, having a language that I could master in a weekend sounded really interesting. And the more I learned about it, the more intrigued I became about what it requires of our minds to speak with such a limited vocabulary and what's required of ourselves in relationship, in connection, in dialogue to make meaning together. So I am thrilled that I am joined by one of the bright lights of the Tokipona community, uh, whose Tokipona name is Jan Usawi, uh, who is a uh, proficient speaker, thinker, um, creator of many other conlangs, constructed languages, and uh, the daughter of a friend. So I was able to reach out to her and get her to agree to be on the podcast. So strap in. This is a far-ranging, wild conversation. It explores things that I did not know existed. And uh, we actually do get into um, some issues of memory reconsolidation and healing through our use of language. So without further ado, Jan Usawi, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. We're going to talk today about lots of stuff, but the framing is something called Toki Pona, which is a language and one that I had not heard of three weeks ago, but as of the last two weeks, I have been really into it and geeking out and telling everybody about it to like amused uh, faces and looks. And I discovered you through a, a video on YouTube um, by a, uh, a channel called Rob Words, who talks about language and linguistics. And since I have a family connection to you, I reached out and here we are. So here we are. Um, well, why don't we start by if you could just talk a little bit about yourself, whatever you think could be useful or relevant as a, as a framing. Yeah. So um... I'm Jan Usawi. That's my uh, Tokipona name. Um, both it, it sort of started as a stage name and then just sort of became the name that I'm known as in the Tokipona community. Um, I speak Tokipona proficiently. I make music in it. I perform music in it live. Um, and I, you know, there's there's been kind of bouts of being less active in the community just because um, I recently graduated college and senior year put a lot on my plate. Um, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm an active member of, of the speaking community online. Okay. So when people hear this, they might think, like, in their minds, tra uh, transpose Tokipona with, like, Spanish or French or Swahili, yes. but, but it's different. Can you, um... it's, it's a very different, yeah. So can you talk about that? So Tokipona is a constructed language, or um, they're often called conlangs for short. Um, you know, a language, in, the, in this case, made by one person, but conlangs in general, like, sometimes they're made by a single person, sometimes made by a whole group of people, um, and are made for a lot of different purposes. Uh, one of the most, some of the most well-known ones are either created for, like, fantasy world-building purposes, if you think about um, Dothraki or Klingon or High Valyrian, uh, the Elvish languages in J.R.R. To Tolkien's works, um, or are created for like international communication, like Esperanto, which is designed to be this, you know, European-centric, culturally neutral and easy to learn language um, for international communication. Um, but there's a whole host of things that they can be made to do. Um, Tokipona specifically, uh, the creator of the language, Sonia Lang, um, 
created it both as linguistic experiment and sort of as a coping tool. One of the like central ideas in the impetus behind it as a language is that simplifying the way that you you speak and the language that you think with can simplify your thoughts. Hmm. So I so I have to admit I'd heard of Esperanto and I knew there were people who like you know wrote operas in Klingon and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I did not realize that this was a thing in oh, terms absolutely. of constructed languages for, <laughs> for sort of fantasy communities or um, do you, mm -hmm. like, how familiar are you with, with those other ones? They're what got me into the broader world of conlanging, which is what led me to Tokipona specifically. Um, I was a big fan of Lord of the Rings as a kid. I got really into learning about the elven languages and knowing that there is this robust grammar underlying it. That was really Tolkien's primary passion that led to the writing of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and the building of that world was to have a place for those languages. Um, but that was sort of my introduction to that world. And it was an art form that I dove into very quickly. I've started a large number of conlangs. Um, there's really one that I consider finished to any degree, but it's, it, it's, it's an art form I've really come to love. I think language is such an integral, integral tool to how we experience the world, and there's so much that can be done with it. I love seeing all the different ways people experiment with it. So as someone who is learning Spanish right now, um, I'm becoming very aware of how language has shaped my assumptions about the world in ways that mm -hmm. have been invisible. Oh, yeah. um, like what, what was the first language, the, either, either a foreign, actual foreign language or conlang that you encountered that, that made you think, oh, this is more than a game or a toy. This is a, mm. this is a technology for, for like brain opening. Oh, interesting. I wanted to think because like language is something I've, been very interested in from a very young age like really my first my first encounters with second language learning were with Hebrew you know doing Hebrew school at synagogue and I remember it being something I was frustrated with because there was all of this focus on just absorbing vocabulary and I'm like I already have an inkling that the grammar of this language is very different from the grammar of English and I want to learn about that I want to delve into that and they're not you know they're not teaching the third graders the Hebrew conjugation charts like <laughs> that's not <laughs> it's not happening um I I do sort of recall that with um I mean there were inklings of that as I was sort of getting into linguistic self-study you know in middle school and high school I took Spanish and um felt like this is cool to learn but also is just grammatically very Similar to what I already know, there was always like a little, you know, pang of frustration whenever we learned a new phrase and it matched word for word to how it's handled in English. And I'm like, I'd like to really sink my teeth into something, something that works differently, that has a different underlying structure. Um, that was partly what led me to um, do self-study of Korean, which I'm a little rusty on. Um, but I remember having a lot of fond memories of understanding like, not just, oh, I've learned this bit of grammar, I've learned that bit of grammar, but like I have a sense of how the system underlying this language is a different system than the one that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I just, want, yeah. I just want to say how, like, I wish I had understood this a long time ago because my mm -hmm. take on, on learning a language was when it, when it was the same, it was easy, right? It transferred. <laughs> And when it was yeah. different, I, I got frustrated as opposed mm. to what you're saying is like the, the differences are the interesting bits. Yeah, it is. It's something that comes up a lot, especially in uh, in the conlanging sphere where a lot of people, a lot of beginners will create something that is or is near to what we call a relex, which is, a, you know, one to one mirror of an existing language's grammar. A lot of beginning conlangs end up kind of like English relexes. There's you know, a one-to-one -one mapping of every word, but the structure is the same. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of encouragement from more experienced members in the community to look at how other natural languages work and see, like, the human mind is capable of so many ways, so many structures and systems to make sense of all of the things in the world. And there, there are more interesting things to be doing than 
not not to say that English's grammar is uninteresting, but more like there's more interesting things to be doing than replicating your default without meaning to. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think about this, especially you know, Spanish has got it's so complicated in terms of the verbs. There's so many, mm -hmm. you know, 50, more than fifty different types of of most oh, yeah. verbs, and and I think about like human evolution. And like a bunch of mm. cave people sitting around, like before we had like grunting <laughs> and then coming up with, you know, you plural feminine would have <laughs> at, a, yeah. at, a, at, a, at a, a, a fixed a time in the past that is indeterminate and may still be going on. <laughs> and, and so like it's, I can't even really imagine something. How, I can't imagine how that happened. But you have people now who are trying mm -hmm. in some way trying to replicate that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, what's as as you've created conlangs? What what's your? Do you have like more of an affinity or more of a, a sort of empathy or understanding for maybe the earliest human attempts to to codify thought in sound? That is that's a big part of a lot of how people conlang. Um, there there's sort of a sphere of it that I'm less as like thoroughly engaged with, but people who create naturalistic conlangs by like creating a prototypical language and then simulating the process of sound changes and grammatical evolution. Um, and while that's not ever something I've fully done, um, you know, to try to create something that fully resembles a natural language with all of its irregularities and strangenesses, um, learning about conlanging from the people who do that, it, it does really get you to think about um, how, you know, if you if you are just beginning to use language as a tool, how do you think to convey the, these very abstract grammatical concepts? Because, you know, something like a single, you know, vowel or syllable at the end of a word that indicates like first person, plural, um, you know, imperfect, subjunctive, like all of these you know, pieces of information that are very heady and abstract to us now, um, they, they often come from more concrete places or they come from like, y you can, I, I, you know, I want to say like, you can trace these things back in time and find out. And it's often not that easy because just the, the act of reconstructing a language's history is, is difficult. Um, but certainly in the act of language construction and not, if not in the act of, you know, study of natural languages, you can, um, sort of reverse engineer and see like it's not just this arbitrary they decided to add a vowel to indicate x y and z um these, these things come from places they have motivations behind them and i've I, I found it very intellectually satisfying to think about um how you might reverse engineer these sorts of things mm -hmm. so i realize i have a lot more sort of philosophical questions but i think we're I'm losing my grounding <laughs> in specifics, so I think you know, because mm. you you and I have some understanding of what Tokipona is yeah. that the people watching do not, and I, I they just sort of <laughs> like stampeded into my consciousness and said, "What the hell are you guys talking about?" I, I sort of realized like we we're like we're getting into all these linguistic conversations, and we haven't like the kind of the central conceit of Tokipona hasn't come up yet. Um, which yeah, I, yeah, I'd be happy to sort of talk about like. The, the specific things that make Tokipona um, unique as a language. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's 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 yeah. do that. Let's let's invite the listeners into the conversation. Yes, now. yes. Um, so Tokipona is um, a minimalist conlang. It's maybe I would say the most famous uh, minimalist conlang. Um, when it when the first book on it was published, it had 125 words. Uh, the community has sort of expanded upon that, elaborated upon that. Is kind of a core agreed upon set of like around 130, 140 words. Um, some people use more than that. Some people use fewer than the base set. But the central idea, you know, to, to get to that notion of like simplifying the language that you speak as a way of simplifying the way that you think about the world, um, the way that that's implemented in the language is um, very simple grammar, right? No verb inflections. Um, no noun cases, that sort of thing, and very few words, which I've found is like, not only works as that tool of simplification, but, you know, as we're talking about, like, how the language you speak 
shapes the way that you think about things, which we can definitely get into, like the different versions of that linguistic hypothesis. Um, framing a thought that I have like initially had in English into Tokipona often requires me to step back and think about the thing I'm speaking about from a different angle mm -hmm. because of the, the constraint of what words are there and what grammatical structures exist. Uh-huh. Gotcha. So yeah, I think I th at some point I was like practicing my introduction t to, to mm -hmm. you. And I think I was going to say, um, uh, Sani Toki. Sa hmm. Which would have, like you you communicate. Oh, Sina. 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 Yeah. Sina gotcha. Toki. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is <laughs> everything's everything's hard for dyslexic. Uh, no, oh, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> so, so okay, Sina Toki, um, mm -hmm. and then like Musi. Ah no no Mi Toki Musi yeah. Uh -huh. Um, ah, Musi is one of my favorite words. So I, I think this is a good example of um, kind of the balance between um, like semantic spaces of different words. Um, the way that Tokipona, you know, counterbalances having so few words is that the words have very broad um, semantic spaces, you know, range of things and ideas that they refer to. So musi, you can maybe recognize it as similar to amusing or musical. It's kind of from that um, romance language root. Um, can mean, and it, you know, like I'm going to use a mix of nouns, adjectives, maybe verbs here. Uh, it can fill any of those roles, but refers to art, entertainment, things that are fun, amusing, but also artful, um, you know, that, that sort of skill can refer to games. Um, it's, it's a very, and like some, some will say like, you know, it's ambiguous. Like, does this word mean art or does it mean game or does it mean fun? Like, it's more accurately than being like an ambiguous word. You're not sure what it means. It is a vague word. It means all of those things. And mm -hmm. um, you well, can use other words to specify if you really want to avoid the confusion. But, um, you know, and I, if I say like me, Toki Musi, um, you know, I speak artfully, I communicate in a fun way, like all of these different shades of meaning that it can have. I, I enjoy the word Musi for how it's able to encompass all of that in one stroke. Mm -hmm. and I, but I was thinking of that when I was listening to Rob Words uh, talking about, like he said, is this ambiguous or is it vague? Mm -hmm. and, and I was kind of thinking, for me, it's neither. Mm. That if you, if you inhabit Tokipona, Musi is just Musi. It's, there's there's yes. no, <laughs> right? Like, like that's what was kind of getting exciting to me. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, it's just like if I said the word fun, you'd say, oh, I know what you mean. But no, you don't. You have no idea what I mean because you have and I have different experiences. You, we, I don't yeah. know what it feels like that that you know mm -hmm. what I, in, in some of the coaching that I do and the and the um, you know the work like people will say words like this it was really frustrating or I felt powerless and I used to say check got it and now like I learned from um, a, a teacher Alan Parry says whenever you hear a word like that replace it with wibble. <laughs> like I feel, I feel wibble. And like, oh, tell me more about that. What is that? What is the experience what does that mean? like? Mm. And, the, that and is, so, yeah. So like when you say Musi, I can go like, is she talking about? Is she amused? Is she amusing? Is it fun? Is it musical? Is she singing? But like, there's there's something like really fun about the idea of just cr of crawling into the language and having it be just itself. Yeah, it's that 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 makes a very good. Point, you know, to think about um, Tokipona certainly seems yeah more more vague, more ambiguous, and for very understandable reason. But words like art and fun are just as amorphous, multifaceted. Um, but there is a a concept that Musi stands for that you know one can say is like specific to Tokipona speaking culture, like you you learn through interaction, through conversation with people what Musi means and that kind of becomes um there's a there's a conling youtuber lichen who talks uh, the metaphor he's used is uh, that a language's vocabulary is like how it slices up the cake of reality 
And mm. it's a cake such that if you slice it differently, it tastes differently. Um, uh-huh. So Musi gets to become like a wholly different slice that you have in your brain. Um, that you have a whole host of English or whatever your you know native language is. You have this host of other words that get at things that could be caught in that slice as well. Um, but it's it introduces a new concept to you know to be able to utilize. Yeah, and 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 it also seems like it's especially as a as a relatively new language with not that many speakers and no government and no, mm-hmm. you know, code of laws, that, it, that every word is also a negotiation. Ooh, yeah. Um, I see. I saw this actually, I was looking back today at the Rob Words video and um, someone commented like, I think Tokipona in part relies on the ability to ask clarifying questions. And their comment sort of went in a like, you know, it's good for this, but there's probably like things you, you know, kind of documentation that you couldn't do in it. And that's sort of like, I, I always hear people's interpretations of like, you can't do X thing in, in Tokipona as, as a bit of a challenge. Like someone's going to find a way to do that. Uh-huh. But it's true that the conversation and kind of the, the conversational process of being a learner is a really big part of Tokipona speaking culture in my observation, Um, you know, both in like just how it's manifested in, you know, discord communities and whatnot. And I think there's even ways that it's like reflected in, in bits of the vocabulary that there are assumptions that you are having a a certain kind of cooperative communication with somebody where um, it's, it's very acceptable to like, all right, pause the topic of conversation. I'm not sure I caught what you just meant. Like, because of the, quote unquote ambiguity, um, there's often times where like you know, both parties in the conversation have to pause and sit down and be like, I want to make sure I got what you meant. And I think that's something that's you know needed in in natural languages too. And um, mm. <laughs> yeah, it's something I, I definitely observe um, from like from a neurodivergent, from an autistic perspective, um, that oh, I'm like losing my train of thought. Um, but like, I, I remember first observing it as sort of, you know, online urgings in the, in the social media spaces I was in to like, be sure to, you know, communicate clearly and, you know, not solely rely on tone, especially over text, like, because autistic people may have a hard time understanding you. And I think in my head, like, I'm not sure the rest of the world doesn't also need that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just to say, like, you know, the, the, being curious about inner experience means yeah. that, that, that there's no language that's going to work. There's, there's no language that's going to translate 100%. And to think mm-hmm. that you have one, to think that because you have specificity, oh, yeah. you know, one, one, of my, one of my teachers talked about like a scale that could weigh a horse to, to, to you know, 4% to four decimal places. Like mm-hmm. you, think, you think you have an answer <laughs> when it's that specific, but it's, no. it's an illusion. Oh, yeah. Um, I can, maybe there's like a way to link this in the podcast description. Um, but that con link I mentioned back that like I, the, the con link of mine I created that I consider being finished. Um, I created as a, a means of, you know, expressing things with a high degree of like emotional and symbolic specificity without a lot of material, literal specificity. And at the end, I, like, I, I gave a presentation on this for the language, con- um, language construction conference. And uh, there's a video of it up on YouTube. And at the end of that presentation, um, I sort of reached the conclusion, like all language is about being curious about someone else's experiences. It is a Mm. tool to try and get at the the inaccessible direct experience that someone else's mind has. Yeah. So I'll put it in the show notes for people who are Mm -hmm. simply listening and just want to make a mental note. Is there a search phrase that they could put Uh, into YouTube? Yes. If um, I believe here... If you search LCC 10 and then Divergent Translation was the title of the talk. Yeah, if I Google that, it comes up first thing. LCC language. Yeah, LCC. I'll put in the chat. Yeah, Language Construction Conference, LCC 10. Divergent Translation. 
Yep. Great. So that, that will that will go into the show notes if people want to look it up. I don't know the number of this episode yet, but if people search for J A N in the Plant Yourself search bar, you will come up. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm thinking like pro- pro- probably I wouldn't want to go to like Tokipona um, operating room. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Hand, My, hand yeah. me hard. Hand me hard thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Hard. Oh, hard very. Object. Yep. Um, yeah. My, what's, what's, my, what's that word for a hard object? A uh, kiwen. Kiwen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. My experience with a lot of that because I, um, I I presented on this at like a you know internal like Tokipona event recently, um, but how you translate like specific sets of jargon or terminology into Tokipona, which I remember seeing a lot in like you know, online discussions, like, this is something Tokipona can't do. You can't write a science textbook in it. And Mm -hmm. my experience is like that, that is something very hard to do. But if you enter the context, knowing that um, a word is going to be used or defined in a certain way, it's very doable to have that sort of jargon. So I think like a Tokipona operating room could exist if everyone already knew that when you're in the operating room, Kiwen refers to this specific thing, sort of like Mm -hmm. these context context-dependent definitions. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, so another thing I thought about, so I, I studied yeah. uh, tarot for, Ooh, for a while. Wow. And just, you know, the, the standard, you know, white European deck. Um, mm-hmm. And there's 78 cards, and they have varying meanings depending on, you know, who's doing the writing. But the, 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 the tarot books and instructors I was most drawn to it really it gave me a vocabulary of uh, it, was, it was it was a way of looking at the world that was very positive it was very growth oriented mm. it was very mm. um, generous it felt like you know that life is a journey of uh, you know there's meaning it's the world is not just random atoms like yeah. it was a, a whole way of of like a spirituality built into the language of those 78 cards and I'm, I'm wondering, from your perspective and like what, whatever Sonia Lang has, has said publicly, like what's, what's your sense of what Tokipona teaches you about the world in general, mm-hmm. independent of its you know, vocabulary and grammar? I mean, yeah, it's a little tricky to say independently of the vocabulary and grammar, because I think a lot of the, um, the, the classic examples that I think of for, you know, what what is the viewpoint that Tokipona imparts? It is, it's something that's very intentionally built into the Okay, yeah, so let's, let's say, the emer- yeah. maybe, maybe better emergent way to say from, emergent yeah. from. Oh, yeah. Um, well, one of the big examples uh, Sonia Lang uses in, um, in her first book about it, Tokipona, the Language of Good, is um, there's not a single word for friend in Tokipona. Uh, and there, there are a number of ways that you could convey it, speakers tend to caution against like we call it lexicalizing where you take a single phrase and are like all right this phrase just means that's how you say friend Mm. and it's like no it it can mean other things there's other ways to communicate the concept of friend but one of the really common ways to do it is yan pona so yan generally means person pona is the word for good that also generally encompasses like simplicity because that's sort of that's one of the other things is like simplicity and goodness if you're if you're learning Tokipona, if you're learning a language with fewer than 200 words, you probably think simplicity is good. Mm. Um, so yanpona, um, modifiers coming after what they modify, means like good person. And that's like, that can get at the idea of what a friend is. Um, so if you want to say bad friend, you you run into a bit of a contradiction there, like a bad good person. Uh-huh. And implicit in at least that usage of Tokipona is... There's, not, there's no such thing as a bad friend. That concept doesn't really translate. And you have to step back and be like, oh, if, they, like, if they're a bad friend, are they a friend? Is that mm-hmm. really the right word to call them by? Like, or do I just say, you know, yan, yan ike tawami, like a person who's bad to me. Uh-huh. Um, my, yeah, um, like another, another example, um, more with like multiple definitions within a single word is the word kute which um, refers to hearing, the, the ear can mean ear as a noun, uh, or to hear as a verb. 
Um, but one of its other meanings as a verb is like to do as one says, to follow someone, to obey someone. Um, and it, it reflects this assumption that the language has that you're engaging in cooperative conversation with someone when you're speaking Tokipona, right? It, the name Tokipona, right? I've mentioned Pona means good. Toki means talk. Like Tokipona is good speech. It's, it's the language of good and like the book's name. So there is an assumption when, you know, when you're speaking in Tokipona, you're speaking to someone who, who has your interests in mind and isn't going to ask you to do something that would be bad for you. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, there's like some kind of guarantee seal that that will always happen. But I like that tends to be the, the community that it's fostered. I notice like mm. it's, it's hard to bully people in Tokipona. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, it's a hard language to be mean in, in a way that like, you know, may, may, I think in part because maybe like inherent, maybe it's inherent or emergent from the vocabulary, but just the community that's built up around it, it, it's a wholesome cause. Like, I don't think people get into a minimalist language that's designed to help you, you know, simplify and reframe the way you think about the world. Um, who are like intent on stirring up drama. It doesn't attract that kind of person. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it reminds me of a framing in general, mm -hmm. right? So like a, th a, thing, a thing I used to do um, le leading workshops, um, it was, you know, around, let's say, you know, cooperation or teamwork or communication is, you know, I'd ask people to get in pairs, find a partner, and then put your hands together in, um, arm wrestling position. Mm. And then I'd say, if you, you know, this is imaginary, I don't have the money, but imagine you got $100 every time your partner's hand touched the table. And, and, and let's do that for the next 60 seconds. Right. And 90% and of the pairs are going to arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> and halfway yeah. through, halfway through, some of them are going to start like recognizing and they're going to like, just gently go back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. and then you, know, you ask like, what did, what did you hear me say? And they'll, they'll say, you asked us to arm wrestle with an opponent. Right. And I said, which, I'm which you never said that. I said, partner, arm wrestling <laughs> position, but that, but that framed it. Right. And, you and hear so, the word wrestle, you think, yeah. And so like Tokipona, when you hear language of good and you kind of, there's a, there's a framing that that precedes the interaction mm -hmm. that I'm imagining creates, you know, generosity and, and musi. How, how would oh, you say, absolutely. how would you say generosity? Uh, first thought that pops into my head is just to say Pona. Pona. Um, you could say to get more specific. Cause like, um, I, I'd use a compound phrase. Wile Pana. Wile is um, want sometimes need. It was initially defined as need, but we've sort of like, it means that insofar as you can frame it as a want for something is the usage I see a lot of people use. Um, you know, it's not, I need to work. It's my job wants me at work. Mm. Um, and then Pana is like to give, to emit, to send out. So like the desire to give generosity, mm. I would put it that way. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I think a, a good anecdotal example of this that I love to use um, was a, uh, Toki Pona, like text conversation I had in one of the big discords. Um, people were just talking about like what the weather was, where they were. Um, and, you know, it was like spring or summer or something. I said like, you know, it's not what I said translated roughly to like, it's not cold where I am, but in, like I'm in my room right now and it's a little cold in here. Um, and someone messaged back, Len, where all it sort of marks like an imperative sentence or something kind of in the realm of an imperative, like command or suggestion or something in that ballpark. Uh, kepeken is like somewhere between verb and preposition. It's like using, with, to use something. And then len is cloth, fabric, cover, those sorts of things. Like put on um, a sweater? Right. Or that? like put on a blanket, like get a blanket. And there was no punctuation. There were no emoticons or anything of the sort. Uh, it was just those three words in the message. Just literally means like, you know, use fabric. Um, but I immediately felt like a warmth coming from it. Like I could feel my heart warm up and it appeared to me very like 
Like, the message just seemed so sweet. Hmm. And it didn't need, like, the clarifier of a smiley face or, like, additional words like, oh, you know, make sure you're, like, like, oh, make sure you get, like, you know, a blanket to stay warm. Um, the fact that we were speaking in Tokipona was the clarifier for that. Hmm. And, like, you could just say, like, those three words, and I immediately, like, understood this is a really, like, kind thing to be saying. Uh-huh. And on the surface, it just means use fabric, but I I didn't read it as that at all. I, like, my instinctual reading was, like, make sure you get a blanket so you stay warm. Well, I mean, that reminds me of what, what I learned about um, screenwriting, mm. where, right, the words that people are using is never what they're really talking about. Mm. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, like there's an underlying, and generally in screenwriting, it's not so nice. It's usually conflict because that's, <laughs> that's what makes stories dramatic and interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, like, thank you for taking out the garbage, you know, underlies, gee, you never do this. What happened? You know, did you just have an affair? What's going on? Why are you being all of a sudden a good husband <laughs> sort of thing? But, but here it yeah. seems like it's, it's, it's the other thing. It's like these very, oh, yeah. very simple, you know, dialogue and and yet there's 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 shared warmth and meaning underneath it right it's yeah the 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 context is so huge in creating that and like the language itself kind of becomes its own context which i I find really cool Mm. yeah i i was like when i said before like it's hard to bully in tokipona i think like conversationally that's true but i almost wanted to backtrack that because um as as a tokipona lyricist um I'm not always writing about like everything being hunky dory. There's there's conflict, there's drama, there's there's anger in in some of my songs, and that I find too like a really interesting design challenge is um, you know how to use the language poetically to convey those things. And so you know like yes, I think too conversationally it's it's hard to bully in Tokipona, but both from my own like lyric writing and from reading. You know, there are um, like short and longer stories that people have written in the language um, that I've read that, you know, are able to bring up like a lot of like pathos and drama and um, and suspense. And so I don't want to give the impression that like the language is anodyne in any way. It, mm. it, it has a lot of potential for like a whole range of feelings. Well, it's, I mean, I'm finding that interesting because it didn't occur to me that it was also it would also work as a written language because it seems oh, so yeah. co-constructed. Um, but when I um, like when I think about like emotions and like I think about like charts of words and the mm-hmm. you know the pictures in kindergarten with all the different yeah. faces and when mm-hmm. and like there's this assumption that in order to be emotionally intelligent or savvy you need a huge vocabulary of emotions. Mm-hmm. And I, want, I wonder what, you, what your insight is uh, from Tokipona yeah. ab- about that. Well, Tokipona really doesn't have too many words for emotions. Like, mo- like the core vocabulary doesn't really specify like that any word only refers to like an emotional domain. There are some like newer words or... Um, words that didn't like make the cut of the first book that some people bring back into their usage that are more specifically emotional that to refer to things like fear or or whatnot um but there's not really like a a category of emotion words there's you know there's the word peeling which transparently kind of english feeling um and then a lot of words that you can put after that to um, to refer to feelings like on the surface, it would seem like you can just refer to peeling pona, peeling ike, feeling good, feeling bad. Um, but I think then beyond that, the the language just kind of gently nudges you to be a little more creative and metaphorical with how you express feelings. Like, what would we were? I was just talking about this with some Toki Pona people last night. Like, what would peeling kiwen mean? Hard hard feelings. Hard or... feelings. Right. Like. Is it referring to maybe like kind of often how I approach these things is like, what's the somatic sensation of the feeling? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, if there's sort of like that, that almost like that feeling of heat or tension in the chest that I might just use like the the Tokipona word for, for heat, for fire, uh, for Mm -hmm. chemical reaction. 
uh, peeling celly, um, uh, that sort of thing. I might describe the cause of the feeling, uh, like, you know, peeling tan yan weka, like the feeling that comes from a person leaving, um, and describe kind of the context for the feeling in that way. Um, peeling kiwen, one of the potential usages we brought up was like, because, um, you know, a feeling can also be like a belief, like a feeling you have about something. An appealing kiwen might then be like a strong opinion that someone else isn't going to be able to budge. Mm. So, so, so yeah. Appealing pe- yan, no, no, like doesn't right. move. Yan, doesn't yeah. Yan li ken ala ante appealing ni. Person can't change that feeling. Um, uh-huh. But that is usually the approach to that sort of thing is to get descriptive, to describe what's the physical sensation of the feeling, what's the event that caused the feeling. And so, you know, rather than being at a lack of ways to, kind of paradoxically for being so lacking in emotional words, it's very rich in ways to describe emotions because you have to, um, you sort of have all, like if there were like a set of emotional words that would, I think, constrict speakers' use of other words to describe their emotions, whereas wh- when there really aren't, you have the whole vocabulary at your disposal to describe the way that you feel. And I think that that can apply to a range of other things beyond just emotional states, but that's like a prime example of where that plays out. Hmm. Well, yeah, what's coming up for me is I've, I've studied uh, hypnotherapy mm. and the idea that there's, you know, s- simplistically say there's two, there's two minds. There's like the unconscious mind that understands that, that understands images and right. sensation and experience. And then there's the cognitive higher mind that understands concepts. And, you know, like we think we're the higher mind, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm, you know, discussing strategy or. Right. Right. But then it's the higher mind that says I am anguished or depressed or aggrieved mm-hmm. and comes up with these words. But if you want to talk to. If you want to make change, it's the primitive mind, the unconscious. Right, it's the mind that's the back se- here. That's right. the seat of everything. So it's almost like this is a language that can speak directly, mm. right? Because if I because if I have if I have an emotion, I've constructed that out of right. sensation. I've I said, oh, this yeah. is you know this feeling, this feeling, this feeling. That must mean anger, or that must mean regret, or that must mean guilt. Mm hmm. This is, yeah, um, a thing I, I, I imagine like I, I get this is like beginner speakers often come and say like, oh, yeah, like what's how do, what's the word for angry? What's the word for sad? And, um, you know, I, I it's been a while since I've spent time in like the, you know, like the the, the particular online spaces that are geared towards you know, learner conversations, but I know, like, if someone came up to me, like a beginner Tokipona speaker, asked me, like, what's the word for angry? I'm like, well, what are you angry about right now? What does it feel like? <laughs> that's that's going to set the tone. Like, that's how you find out. And it's, you know, there there's there's fun in some of the words, like the words I mentioned, like monsuta is a newer added word that means fear. Apea kind of refers to, like, guilt or shame. And I do like having those at my disposal lyrically, but it's also very fulfilling to think like to, to, to try and define those in, in more concrete ways, ways that are like more grounded in the actual context of the situation. Got it. So I'm, I'm feeling the need to get uh, concrete again. And mm-hmm. maybe, maybe we could um, talk about just the, the phonemes, the sounds mm. oh, of the yeah. language and, and do that through giving me a, a Tokipona name. Oh, excellent. Um, so this this is another aspect of the of the simplicity to Tokipona is there are very few phonemes, very few sounds that make up the language. I think it comes out to nine consonants and five vowels. Um, everything is written fully phonetically. English speakers generally just have to get used to the fact that the letter J makes a Y sound and not a J sound. Um, Hallelujah. Um, mm-hmm. And syllable structure is very simple too. There's uh, Almost no consonant clusters. You can have like N and then something after. Um, that's about it. Certain like consonant vowel combinations that are hard to disambiguate or harder to pronounce aren't allowed in the language. So everything is very geared to make it like 
easy to pronounce and then like easy to to pick up as a listener. Um, so like this often, I was thinking about this when you mentioned earlier, like coming up with a Tokipona name for you. Um, the reason that I go by Yan Usawi is initially when I went on, you know, on the Discord server, um, like the kind of the, the biggest, uh, the biggest one for Tokipona speakers, I, at the time I'd been using the name Ari a lot as like an online pseudonym. Cause like, I don't have a very common first name. And I was like, I, I'd like a little degree of anonymity in those sorts of spaces. So I took that name, Ari, and put it into Tokipona uh, phonotactics. So there's no R sound because um, regardless of the R sound in different languages, they're often easy to confuse for other things like L or W. Um, so the English R kind of becomes a W sound in Tokipona. So it's Yan Awi. Uh, yan meaning person, like all of the names are basically treated like adjectives. You don't have to say Aoi, it's the person Aoi. Uh, and then as I started thinking about making music in Tokipona and what name I wanted to go by, I went to um, Usawi is um, like a newly added word, relatively newly, referring to magic, enchantment, Mm. the supernatural those sorts of things and i thought like oh it ends in aoi it's kind of a reference to my name but then like yanu sawi also sort of means like wizard or supernatural person and i think that's very fun um the funny thing is that howie because there's no h sound and there aren't really diphthongs in that way like ow wouldn't exist howie mm. also becomes aoi uh-huh so we could we would both at least like, you know, going by Ari being that name, like, we'd both be Yan Aoi. Um, if you just take the name and um, Tokiponize it, is how we call mm. it. Okay. <laughs> can, can I add my own special uh, prefix to it somehow? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's, um, you know, taking one's just English name and Tokiponizing it is one way of, like, creating a Tokipona name. Some people, you know, like take syllables from different words and compound them into new ones or just like use a word. Like I kind of do that in a way using uh -huh. a word as my name or just come up with like a set of sounds that fit like fits. Um, I would, if you were going to stick with like tokiponizing your English name, I would think like Howard, you might mm. communicate like that word final D by adding like a te to the end. So like Yan Awate could work as well. But okay. it comes down to like, you know, there's all these different strategies. And once one of them lands you on something that you like, you go with it. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Could it could it be a word that that's just a name that doesn't have that isn't a word like us Usawi is actually a word. But mm -hmm. like, you know, could I be like, yeah, like Tokawi, the communicating Howie? Oh, oh, I like that a lot. Yan Tokawi. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. that would work. Yeah. Mm hmm. Woo -hoo! Yeah, there's a lot of room for, for creativity there. Awesome, awesome. So maybe we could do a, a little uh, lesson, like for Ooh. for beginners, and just Ooh, okay. uh, like te teach me and through me, my audience, some useful yeah, stuff. Yeah, so let's, um, let's say I can, we can start with like kind of the, the framework for a basic sentence in Tokipona. Um, there's sort of... Let me think, because I, I, I have less, like, there are people in the community who, you know, have created, like, entire lesson plans for Tokipona. Um, yeah, and we don't, and have, you know, just a through. couple, of course, yeah. Just a couple of words, just, and we can point mm -hmm. those out, because I also want to talk to you about music. Oh, yeah, of course. And answers. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure, yes, yeah, if the video is up, the audience is wondering, for sure. Um, but, yeah, we'll get to that. Well, I was going to include, like, you know, a couple words, and then just, like, the words that you would need to turn them into a sentence. So let's take, um, you know, Jan, again, for person. Um, we'll do, what's like a good verb? Hmm. Let's, let's take Tawa. This, this could be interesting. Tawa means, um, as a verb, it means to move, like to go, to leave, to move. Um, like towards. It, yeah, as a preposition, it means towards. Okay. Um, and then we'll we'll work with what we've got. We got kiwen, right? Hard, okay. solid object, rock, metal, similar things. 
Uh, the two other words that let us turn that into a sentence um, aren't, those are, so those are what we call like content words, like that carry that kind of semantic meaning, yan, person, tawa, movement, kiwen, solidness. Um, then alongside content words, you have particles, which just feel like grammatical functions. And the ones that we would need here are li and e. Li makes whatever like the next thing is the predicate of the sentence. And that can be like the verb that the subject does, or it can be something that the subject is, um, either like as a noun or an adjective. And then e marks the direct object of a sentence. Um, like whatever comes after e is the object, like the thing the verb's done to. So I can say yan li kiwen, like the person that could mean like the person is a rock. It could mean like the person is solid, is hard to move. Um, or I can make a sentence with an object. Yan li tawa e kiwen. The person moves the rock. Um, what's interesting with tawa is if I take out the, the e, tawa is functioning now as more of like a preposition. So yan li tawa kiwen literally means like the person is towards the rock, like the person goes to the rock. Mm. But tawa e is moves it. The The classic example is like mi tawa tomo. When I use mi, you can take, you, you usually take li out. Like mi tawa tomo means I go home. Mi tawa e tomo is like I move my house. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And would probably be interpreted as like literally pushing your house to a different location rather than moving to a different house. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So that's like the humorous example people will sometimes use. Okay. Great. And um, just for folks who are you know, curious and interested, like what's the time commitment to first, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to understand, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, written or spoken, and then, you know, to, to be able to speak? Like mm -hmm. how, long does this, yeah. how long does this take people? Ah, uh, it varies. It it's definitely sort of a clickbaity thing on the internet to be like, oh, you can learn this language in a day, and that's not true. Um, I would say, like, I definitely did, like, the first round of vocabulary study within one day. Usually the number I've seen is, like, if you dedicate, like, a weekend or two to vocabulary study, you can get, like, most of it within at least like, you know, working memory, it, it might take a little longer to like get everything into long-term memory. I still forget certain words that exist and have to be reminded like, oh yeah, that's, that's there in the vocabulary. Um, but, you know, take like a couple of days of, you know, there's, um, you know, there's like flashcard decks. Uh, there are lesson plans that like introduce bits of vocabulary at a time along with a piece of grammar. Um, so you could kind of go about it like learning vocab and grammar at the same time, or you could take like a couple days to get the grammar into memory, a couple of days to, you know, practice, or did I say grammar to vocabulary into memory, a couple of days to get the vocab into memory, a um, couple of days to practice using it with the grammar. Um, Cause there are some oddities about Tokipona grammar that, you know, take a while for beginners. And then sort of, I guess after that, like, I'm thinking because I, I know I pick up language stuff very quickly. So like using my personal examples of this is how long it took me after learning the stuff to like become proficient in speaking, like is going to be faster probably than for the average person. Um, but I'll also like I'm, you know, my partner has started learning Tokipona and it's been, I think, a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And we're like, you know, we're having like small conversations back and forth. Um, that's definitely one of the appeals of the language is like there's it, there's a much shorter timeline and kind of like an end point to, like an end point in sight to like, I am now proficient in this language more or less. And then it's mm -hmm. just like, um, I mean, there's certainly like, I can get more fluent at it for sure. There are people I hear speaking where I'm like, I cannot keep up with y'all. This is incredible. Um, but I would say for like, you know, probably takes like uh, like a week or so to get the language in your head and then a couple of weeks of talking with people writing in it putting into practice it doesn't 
take that long, especially, certainly compared to natural languages, to you know, get pretty proficient in it. Hmm. Would you say for folks who want to get better at languages that this would be a good starter experience if they're feeling hmm. um, intimidated? I, I'm inclined to say so. I think it, you know, it, it gives like an approachable experience of learning grammar that you're not used to. Um, you know, the, the way that Tokipona handles things like if when sentences um, is different from like how English does it and different from like a lot of the um, natural languages I know, the ways that they handle if when it doesn't do the same things that the way Tokipona does it um, will do. So there's definitely you get that experience of learning grammar you aren't used to, learning vocabulary distinctions you aren't used to, getting used to like um, just speaking habits and customs within the community, like learning that kind of firsthand, it, it'll give you a lot of those experiences that um, often create the difficulty in learning natural languages, but on like on an approachable scale. I think it's it's like a good so it's, it's a good like starting exercise for that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Now there's there's something you know around online communities where it's very precious that there's a small group of us. And we're, we know each other and it's safe and we're nerds mm -hmm. and, you yeah. know, the rest of the world doesn't get it. And, you know, gr growing up in a world where when you were a nerd, you got the shit kicked out of you in middle school <laughs> to a world where everybody can be a nerd and have a community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a language and languages, I think, want to grow. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. Like they have, they have a desire, like an innate inclination um, how, how does the community balance that? And is there a vision yeah. for like Tokipona as a healing tool? I would say like in, in the community as, as far as I'm engaged in it, um, there's not so much like a vision for like what we're going to do to the world with Tokipona or like there's, there's definitely like kind of all of the jokes that I see about like proselytizing the language are less about like, if we get more people to speak this, like think of what we can do for the world and more like, I want more, more friends to speak this language with. It's really fun. I think more people should get into it. I think that's where the community tends to lie. Um, but sort of once you're in that space, there's a lot of room for philosophical discussion of like what this language does for people, what it allows you to accomplish. I just think there's very little interest in, I, I would guess a, a, a decent amount of skepticism around like trying to like expand the community or take the language in a direction with that, like at the forefront. I feel like it's kind of a putting the cart before the horse. Like it's, there's more of an experience of you get into this for whatever reason you get into it. Like a lot of people are just like, I want to know how to speak a second language and this is easy to do. And to let the the philosophy and the healing and all of those things that it, it really has a lot of potency to do um, be something that people come to on their own. It's certainly part of the you know initial intention, like from what the author talked about, like it was a way for her to um, you know like avoid negative thought spirals. Um, but we don't really promote it as a language that will do that if that's not something people are interested in it for like we'll talk about it for sure right. um but there, there's not the sense of like there being a one size fits all thing that this language is going to do for people it's if this seems like it's going to do something for you that you're interested in be that you know getting you to speak a language that you can like talk to your friends in secret and not have people understand or you know, like a therapeutic purpose or a philosophical pursuit, like, you know, fi find the in that you like. And if you don't see one in this language, like find the other things that are going to do that for you. Hmm. Um, yeah. How, how has Tokipona changed your life? Mm. Uh, and, and I guess I'm, I'm spe specifically thinking about sort of internal processes as opposed to I have this yeah. group and I, you know, mm. I mean, that is a that is a big part of how I have engaged with it and how it's affected me is like, um, I, I, I'm i going to 
work, work the best I can with the desire to like extricate those two things. But certainly a lot of the like internal process stuff I've gained from, you know, Tokipona as a language has been through like discussing it with other people and learning how other people see it, their opinions on different things within it. Um, it, it certainly has inspired like the way that I, like it's affected the way that I create languages. Um, pretty much every conlanging project I've done since Tokipona, I've sort of wanted to, um, you know, not replicate its vocabulary one-to-one, -one, but um, explore that kind of multifacetedness and broadness and like all the opportunities that I've learned you can get from minimal vocabulary. Um, and, and lyrically, I have to imagine it's, it's stretched my, you know, ability to use metaphor, to rhyme cleverly, um, to, to think about wordplay in new ways. Um, as far as like internal emotional processes go, um, that's at least in like, you know, the forefront of my attention, it's been shaped more by other things. Um, like my work with internal family systems therapy has been huge. Um, and, and I, it'd definitely be worth it to, to think more about how, like, how Tokipona either has affected that or, you know, could be used for it further. Uh -huh. Oh, man, I just, uh, I realize we've, we've been having a sub-conversation about therapeutic <laughs> systems. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's, it's, I... I am, I am, I am totally into parts work, and, and oh yeah, a, a lot of the subconscious stuff comes it's, come it's been, from my understanding. It's been huge for me, yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely mm -hmm. like, you know, to, as far as like Tokibona has been a jumping off point in the conversation to talk about, like, the 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 parts of the mind that process things through image and sensation and not through abstract concept. Um, it's something that I you know, I've, I've gotten experience in that through parts work. I was going to mention a, um, someone I know through like the tabletop role-playing game writing scene, um, uh, Maria Mison, who, um, on her blog, which I think is now just like on the internet archive, um, talked about like, you know, engaging with those images as a therapeutic model. And, like this conversation is getting me to think more about the through line that connects Tokipona to those things and yes yeah, give, give me good stuff mm -hmm. to think about definitely more to like work with there um i think i it's very likely i'll find that like you know engaging with that process of reframing things linguistically that aren't so related to you know internal emotional occurrences has probably helped how my brain does that even when I'm not thinking about it in Tokipona terms, it's kind of helped stretch that muscle. Hmm. Wow, this is so interesting. <laughs> I'm so thrilled because the, you know, the, the work that I do with people is all um, memory reconsolidation, which is mm -hmm. one of the things that, that IFS can do to kind of help yeah. us see that, <clears throat> that the way, and this is, I think this is related to Tokipona, that the way our, our minds have created a lesson from stuff mm. that happened to us it's almost mm -hmm. like Tokipona is the stuff and English is the, the vocabulary <laughs> of lesson. And when we can get back to the stuff, like, oh, this is the experience that, mm. you know, I'm, I'm picturing this or remembering this, um, this dynamic. And it makes, you know, small child, hard room, <laughs> cold, <laughs> you know. Interesting. Put, you know, put fabric. Mm. It's all. It's almost like that's mm. the level at which Interesting, yeah. the brain can rewire. I, I I think about the process of when I come across a sentence that, like, makes me take a second to think. Like, how do I phrase this in Tokipona? And I have to like kind of leave the realm of the sentence I was trying to translate and think about it differently. It's almost like you know present moment reconsolidation. Hmm. Um, yeah. of saying like, all right, this is the framework I'm thinking about it in. I think the, the, the most at hand example is um, there's not a verb for to like something. Um, like in English, um, liking is an action where the, the person having those feelings is the subject and the thing being liked is the object. Um, there's not really a way, unless you're talking about love and they're like the, the Tokipana word for love is really more of a social thing you wouldn't use it to talk about loving an activity or an object. 
um, what you do pretty much like the vast majority of the time is say, this thing is good to me. The mm -hmm. subject object relationship yeah. is same changed, in, but Lannister same in Spanish. And, oh yeah. Right. right. Like, gusta, that's the, like it pleases me. Yeah. Um, me encanta. Me interesa. Like, right, yeah, that's, it, that's like, the thing that first the freaked me out. Um, Korean even does a, a similar thing. It's, um, there is an option that has more of that subject object relationship we're used to in English, but it's um, kind of the, the thing it's derived from is more like when it comes to me, this thing is good, mm. which is, is really intuitive, I think. And um, I know Japanese takes a similar, um, a similar strategy. Like, it just it it gets you to not take one of those frameworks for granted, is my my big takeaway. Yeah. So I want I want to make sure we talk about your music, mm -hmm. and maybe with with your permission we could we could go out with a with a with a oh, song which, which I will I will add in post because I'm I'm not mm -hmm. that I'm not that technically savvy <laughs> to do this right now. Uh, but maybe you could mm -hmm. na name a tune and and talk a little Ooh. bit about. You know, oh yeah. What's, what's important to you about it? Oh man, there's a there's a lot of tunes. Let me go and um, pull up the band camp. Um, so I've put out a decent amount of music. Um, on I I release my music as Yanu Sawi um, to Bandcamp and to YouTube, and there there will be some effort in the near future to get stuff to Spotify. Um, there's like a couple songs I've been featured on that are on there. Um, but a lot of original music and like one album of uh, covers and parodies, which is really interesting to work on. <laughs> so yeah. translation, translations, of... translations, and um, even a couple of songs that are like, um, you know, partly or wholly in English, but about Tokipona topics. Mm. Um, they're like that's that's sort of where the album veers more into parody. Was like, oh, there was this little bit of internet drama, um, you know, around like half as interesting put out a video about Toki Pona that was like poorly informed and had a bunch of AI stuff. And like this YouTuber who's talked about Toki Pona got into just like some just objectively silly YouTube comment drama. I'm going to make a little parody song uh -huh. about it. Um, God, what that's reminding me of is, um, I want to say 1979 Camp Rama in the Berkshires. We did our, mm. um, Jewish Jewish camp, Hebrew, very intensive Hebrew, and we had to we did a, every uh, group does their play or musical. Yeah, and, and yeah. ours for that for some reason was the songs of like Simon and Garfunkel and Carol King, and I knew nothing. Mm. Of, I knew nothing about <laughs> Carol King, but we sang all these different songs in Hebrew, and then like years later, I, I learned them in English, and I'm like, boy, they're better in Hebrew. <laughs> Or, yeah, or, I mean, or yeah. like they're so weird, it, like mm -hmm. the, that idea of translating a yeah. song and and just what what you have to do to to make it work mm -hmm. in the other language is not a direct translation. Oh yeah, I um, you know, having I'm I'm far less active in it now, but having been in the K-pop fandom for quite a while, um, you know, sort of at the same time as I was doing uh, Korean study, there's like a big part of the like the YouTube K-pop fandom sphere is doing song translations. It's like here's the here's my English version of this song and and you sort of see like a lot of people are, you know, finding a way to translate the meaning that roughly matches the number of syllables and sort of rhymes, um, but like doesn't feel like English language lyrics or like there would be another way of um, translating it that matches the sound of the original in a really satisfying way. Um, it was, it, I've come to really um, enjoy the art of like translating a song as an intellectual exercise. There was a lot of that on the, on the cover album. Mm. Um, but as far as original music goes, um, I'm thinking let's do the song Cena as, as the sign off song. This is a recent one of mine. Um, it's a good example of some of what I'm what I was talking about earlier with the wordplay that can be done in Tokipona because there are um, so few so few sounds so few like possible rhyme schemes and you know handfuls of words that sound similar to each other. Um, so Sina is the second person pronoun, right? Is you yours? 
Um, but there's also a word seen, which means like new or fresh or renewed. And then ah, which is like an interjection, an intensifier. So seen ah is just like something new. Uh -huh. um, and I wrote that song, Sina, um, to kind of utilize both meanings at the same time. Um, like lines where you could you could read it with either the the you meaning or the something new meaning, um, and get like get two different parallel meanings out of it that are both relevant to the song. It was a really mm. interesting thing to work with. Uh -huh. um, there was a similar bit actually in like uh, one of the verses with uh, the word kalama, which means like sound or to make a sound, to shout, to vocalize. Um, and then the word kala, which means fish, and ma, which means like land or earth. Um, so I like sometimes like I'd seen jokes about, you know, kalama meaning land fish. It's just like a silly thing. Um, but I, I tried to make that work in almost a, you know, story of like Little Mermaid coming onto land. Um, you know, like, I, I won't take the, the full time to, like, translate the lines that give it context and the line in which the pun occurs in, but to make both kalama and kalama work as, like, equally valid and relevant interpretations of the same line. Um, mm -hmm. Just that that kind of wordplay is su such a delight to me. Mm. And it seems like it works because it wasn't engineered into the language on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, because all of these, these words are all borrowed, I've sort of referenced bits of it earlier, they're all borrowed from other languages, a um, number of them from English by way of like a pidgin language, Tokpisin, which partly inspires the grammar, but some like um, that word kute is from the French écouter for listen, um, I have to, I can't remember where kiwen is from, there's some from like, um, I think there's like some Croatian words, um, some some from Japanese or from Cantonese. There's kind of like there's like a whole range covered there. Um, mm -hmm. So these similarities are, you know, largely coincidental. Um, you know, only not coincidental insofar as they were kept in the language and a different source wasn't chosen. Um, and it just creates these little these little playgrounds to, to oh. mess around with. Wow, I, I'm thinking about the Sina and Sin A. Um, I just finished, I don't know if you're a Terry Pratchett fan. I need to get more into his, his books. I have The Color of Magic on my shelf, and I've, I've started it a couple of times. It's, and it's his worst to... one. It's his, it's, oh. the first, it's his first Discworld book. Throw, don't, don't start on that one. <laughs> All right. I, I just finished uh, The Thief of Time yesterday well for the for the third time and it's about yeah. it's a, it has a cosmology of time and one of the ideas is that the universe is recreated every second every every mm -hmm. tick every instant and right. so all we have of the past is memory and so i was thinking like yeah. sina sina like if i come to you and yeah. i say oh yeah you're sina i know you're, who you you're are something new every time right oh that's interesting too yeah i can i see that like that's the kind of thing that, you know, if it does, like, probably wouldn't come up in conversation outside of, like, discussing these sorts of wordplay directly, but, like, I'd love to see other, you know, like, a short story could play on that so well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And finally, the antlers. So for folks who are oh, yes. watching this, um, <laughs> watching the video, you are, you are sporting antlers. I, assu I assume mm -hmm. those, are, those are not organic to these you. These are not. No, these are, these are 3D printed. Um, I learned this relatively recently that they were made by uh, the same person who made the antlers in the Saltburn movie, and like this is the same pattern, just like down a size. Okay. Which I've I've gotten like you know questions from people like, oh, is that from Saltburn? And I have to be like, no, it's this is its own <laughs> this is its own thing. Um, but I I had recently like a, well, I mean it it stretched back further than recently, but kind of like hit its peak just you know partly from like college work veering towards burnout um, where I felt very disconnected, very dissociated, like hard to just like be present in my own body and in the environment that that body was in and um, found like, however, paradoxically though, like knowing 
my own inner workings, it's not very paradoxical that engaging in these elements of fantasy helped me to ground, helped me to be present, like made it feel safer and more accessible to like interface with the mundane world when I knew that I was able to like come at it from a place of wonder and weirdness. And I had gotten these all ready to like do some occasional costuming and cosplay things with. And uh, a couple of people had seen me wear them and said it like took a second or two to register that like, it wasn't just what I looked like, um, (laughs) that it just, it's, it seems to fit me well. And so it, it gradually like became a thing that I, you know, I wear these pretty much everywhere I go. I, you know, put them on every morning. Um, it's, it's become like a nice part of that routine and a way for me to like know that I'm always able to present that side of myself to people. Like as I try to unmask more and show more of my own strangeness to the world, it becomes like a way to very upfront show people this is what I'm about. Mm. Yeah. That's so interesting. I, was, I had a long chat with my daughter this morning about un, basically unmasking ourselves and mm-hmm. um, you know so she's you know my, my Gen Z guide to being more of myself and being less, um, as a friend of mine puts it, a stale pale male. Um, <laughs> and, and this I, you know she's, she's like encouraging me to listen to like musical artists who who defy any you know like this is who you are and 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 they, like once they come out with something everyone's like okay this is who you are and then they immediately break the mold con- continually yeah. um and i'm thinking like i probably wouldn't do antlers but there, there's there's something nice about having a thing mm-hmm. that reminds me um you know, yeah. there's, there's a there's a book um the, I think it's the alter ego effect or something like that, talking about people like Beyonce who became Sasha Fierce in right. order to oh, yeah. in, in order to be something, or you know, and this guy would always wear like Superman Clark Kent glasses <laughs> to to remind himself that he could take them off and be a superhero. Oh, and that's I, excellent. Um, and I think there's there's something so first of all, it's really, but I imagine challenging and inviting for the people in your life, especially those mm-hmm. who don't know you, to be confronted with something that invites them to fly fly their freak flag a little bit too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was going to say like, there's something I really enjoy about having that reminder to myself also be something public facing. Um, Because as as much as I want to um, unmask myself and invite more magic into my own life, I want to put that in other people's heads too. Right. And that, yeah, that everyone's got some, some invisible version of it mm-hmm. that they're trying, they're probably, they're trying to hide and probably not doing a great job. of. <laughs> yeah. So. Mm. Awesome. So, so the, the songs we'll, we'll uh, go out with are Sina and Kalama. Well, Sina is, is the name of the song that has the Kalama pun. Oh, okay. So it's and one the song. Sina pun. It's one I song. See. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. So we're going out with one song. Um, mm-hmm. any, anything you want to f- end with? Um, have, mm. the, have the last word. Ooh. Um. Ooh, well, I can say um, this is actually a good time because I, I sort of want, I was thinking about like, I want to make this kind of like an invitation for anyone listening who's interested to, you know, kind of come into the community. I'm aware, like, I was sort of out of the what's been the main discord server for a while in my last year of college and came back to learn that like there was like there were some issues going on there that make me um like a little less like oh this is the place to go if you want to learn to speak tokipona because like there there is some like community moderation upset that happened there um but I will say, like, there are a lot of online places. Uh, I believe there are Facebook groups, there are subreddits, there are, there are like, a whole lot of Discord servers. Um, you know, I'm sure, like, forum spaces. Um, the, the online community is huge and, like, on the whole, like, drama aside, even in those places, like, I, the, the, the people there I have always found, like, extremely welcoming um 
good to good to learn from and have conversations with. So again, like um if 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 for you know whatever your reason is if you're interested in Tokipona like th- this is like my welcome to you to like find like find a way into the community speaking like if you want to learn this having conversation with people is such a huge part of it and a huge part of how you discover all these other aspects of what the language can do what people are doing with it i didn't realize initially when I started learning the language that people were making any kind of music in it um but that whole scene like appeared before me and it's been incredible to like get into it um so again like not to not to proselytize but to to warmly encourage you to to give it a shot it's it is a very fun and rewarding experience Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm not hearing proselytization. I'm hearing a, an invitation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, again, we're, if people want to follow your work, where do mm-hmm. they go? Um, so they can go to Bandcamp at, um, you know, J-A-N-U-S-A-W-I dot Bandcamp dot com. Um, you can find me on YouTube also as Yanu Sawi. Um, that's where, like, you know, I have, I have uploads of all of my songs. Uh the most recent of them also has a music video, uh, but most of it is just like the audio uploaded there to listen in that environment. Um, I have a Patreon. I'm Yanu Sawi on Patreon. Um, it is it has become less of a like place where I you know post exclusive perks and more just um, if you want to support me directly, like that's one of the places you can do it. Bandcamp is also a way to do that. There's um, you know free streaming like a minimum price to download songs and then like a pay above that model, which I've, I found really useful. All right. All right. I'll put all those in the show notes, but Jan Usawi, J-A-N-U-S-A-W-I on Patreon, Bandcamp, uh, YouTube. We'll, we'll get folks in touch with you and your music. Thank you so much. This has been excellent conversation. Yeah, Jan Usawi, thank you so much. I really appreciate your willingness to to jump in and and share oh, so yeah. so musi and, <laughs> and and so pona. Thank you so much. Ah, sina pona. Uh, take care. You too. And that's a wrap, almost. So you can get the show notes for today's episode at plantyourself.com slash five nine four. And I want to take us out with Sina by Jan Usawi. for this episode as always be well